Well, it's time for us to begin. We do appreciate your being here. Appreciate those that join us online as well. We're studying the book of Jeremiah. We are in chapter 32. Uh, before we begin our study, we'll begin with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for your love for us and just thank you, Lord, for this time we have to come together and study from your word. We just pray, Lord, that you'll help us to learn better how to please you and be what you want us to be. And We ask you to be with those that are sick. We pray for those that have lost loved ones. We pray for those that are homebound and those that are facing various problems in their lives and just pray you'll give them peace and comfort and healing where it's your will and help us, Father, to do what we can to be an encouragement to others. We pray that you'll be with the church here at Ephesus and help us to grow and help us just to be the church you want us to be in this community. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, chapter 32. Uh, we're actually ready for question number 14, which is all the way down to like verse 28. But this chapter begins in the 10th year of King Zedekiah of Judah, uh, which is the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar is uh, and his army have besieged the city of Jerusalem. Uh, they have siege walls up, up against it, which means that they not only surround it, but they have made it where nobody can go in and out of the city. So uh, it's just a matter of holding out long enough that uh, eventually the people inside starve to death and, and have to give up. And so this was one of the methods they used many times to conquer uh, various places, especially if they had a, a fortified city, then they, that was easier than trying to break the walls down and all that kind of stuff. So. Uh, they did that, and then eventually they do break the walls down, but at this point they don't. Uh, but we see in, in this one that uh, in this, this chapter is where the Lord appears to Jeremiah and said, your uncle's son is going to come to you and ask you to buy some land. And sure enough, he came, and uh, Jeremiah is confined to the, the court of the guard, uh, and so he's Im actually imprisoned at this time. Uh, and, but his nephew, uh, his uncle's son, his cousin, comes and uh, says, I've got this property and you have the right to redeem it and uh, we we'll, want you to buy it. And so Jeremiah said, okay, this is the Lord's will and since God told me about it. And so he does that uh, and he buys it. And then the Lord said, okay, take the deed uh, that signed and sealed and witnessed and all of that and put it in an earthenware jar so that it'll be secure for a long period of time. Uh, and so Jeremiah prays to the Lord and uh, he, he says uh, basically to the Lord, uh, you know, here, I know you're powerful, I know you're God, I know you're right, I know all of this, but... Uh, this don't make sense for me to buy this property because you've been telling me all this time that, that uh, Nebuchadnezzar and his army are fixing to come in and destroy Jerusalem uh, and the property won't be worth anything, so why, why did you want me to buy it? Uh, and so that, that seems to be his question. Is, uh, and God's answer basically was, is anything too hard for me? Uh, he, he didn't really go on to explain other than he said, uh, there will be a time when people will buy and sell again. And that, that's sort of uh, the gist of what the Lord told him. Uh, and so that brings us down ready to question number 14 uh, on page 57 of the workbook if you have a book. Summarize in a few words God's explanation to Jeremiah. Okay, uh, I, I thought it was sort of, sort of interesting some of the things that he said there. Uh, he, he says, you've, you've done all these detestable idols and you built these things to, to Baal and, you've, and not only that, but you uh, built the, the gods to Molech and Chemosh and offered up your children as sacrifice. 
And he said, that idea of offering children as a sacrifice never even entered my mind. He said, I never commanded you, nor did it ever even enter my mind to do such a thing. Uh, and so, yeah, the explanation is that uh, that all of these, because of their wickedness, that, that Judah and, and, and the surrounding area, Jerusalem and the surrounding area is going to be destroyed. Uh, God was driving them out in his blank, blank, and great blank. In his anger, his, okay, his anger, his fury, okay. Uh, one translation says wrath there. Uh, and then the, the last one is indignation. indignation, okay. And then you, depending on translation, you may have different words there, but. What's the difference in anger and wrath and indignation? Or is there a difference? Not a whole lot. Okay. Okay, sort of build on each other. Yeah, getting getting worse and worse and worse. Yeah, that was sort of how I looked at it when I saw that. You know, his anger and his wrath. Wrath is anger that's built up. And then indignation is something that's even built beyond that it's where it's just totally detestable. And so he says, in my wrath and in my anger and my wrath and my indignation, uh, I'm going to drive these people out of their land. But then he said, but I will do what? Bring them back. Okay, bring them back or gather them out of the... He said, I will gather them back out of the lands where I have driven them. And so he says, yeah, I'm going to drive them all out, but now I'm going to bring them back. And so he, he and this is, of course, this is not the first time we've seen this, uh, you know. And, and this goes back to what I told you uh, way back when we first got going in Jeremiah. It's not really that difficult to understand Jeremiah. Uh, some parts of it's hard to figure out who's talking and exactly what they're talking about and some other things like that. But the, the lesson of Jeremiah is very, very simple. The people were wicked and they had been warned and they refused to repent and God warned them repeatedly and they still refused to repent actually over a period of several hundred years uh, and God gave them warning after warning after warning. Finally, God said, okay, enough is enough and this is where Jeremiah comes in he says, God's had enough and he's fixing to bring his wrath on you and he's fixing to destroy this place. Uh, however, you're still God's people and so after a period of time, God's going to bring you back. And, well, and the yeah. last part of this, uh, of verse 15, answers why God told Jeremiah to buy the land. Yeah. Yeah, it does. He said, because I'm going to bring you back. And he said, uh, the land will be bought and sold again. And so it will be worth something. Not right now, but it will be. All right. What promised blessings do you see here? Okay, it'll be God's people again. Actually, from verses 37 all the way through 42 is where this question is taken from. Uh, Verse 38, they shall be my people, I'll be their God, I'll give them one heart, one way, they may fear me always for their own good, for the good of the children after them. I'll make an everlasting covenant with them, I'll not turn away from them to do them good, and I'll put fear of me in their hearts, so they'll not turn away from me. I'll rejoice over them to do good, and will faithfully plant them in this land with all my heart and my soul. For thus says the Lord, just as I brought all this calamity on the people, so I'm going to bring them all good that I'm promising. And fields shall be bought and sold in the land, which you say it's a desolation. Uh, I think in this reading, and this is one of those that, that's a little difficult sometimes to see exactly what's being said. Uh, but it seems to me that this is one of those places where you have the twofold promise. You have the promise of Jeremiah that God is saying, okay, I'm going to bring the people back to the land of Judah and they're going to rebuild and they're going to live here, the Jewish people. But when he talks about, I'm going to give an everlasting covenant and they'll be my people uh, and, and so on and, and they'll, they'll remain faithful. 
I think he's talking about the spiritual kingdom that was to come through Christ. It just seems to me that that's, that is the case. And we see that even more in the next chapter than it is in this one. Uh, but it seems to me that, that there are a lot of references in the book of Jeremiah. Some of them are actually quoted, and we know they, re, they apply to the spiritual kingdom uh, because they're quoted in the New Testament uh, to show that. But some of them are not, and it's sort of up to us to decide, is this a, a twofold thing? That's one of the things about Old Testament prophecies. A lot of times... Uh, it has reference to the immediate situation in a physical sense, but it also has reference to some future event uh, that's talking about the spiritual kingdom of Christ or the coming Messiah or something else related to that. Uh, and and that, that seems to me to be the case here. And I don't know that this one says that, right? No. I, mean, yeah. I, don't think, I don't think the people of, of Israel and Judah did. Yeah, and I think that's why when Jesus came, they were looking for an earthly kingdom. They were not looking for a spiritual kingdom. I, I, I doubt seriously that there was anybody other than Jesus at the time Jesus was on earth that understood about the spiritual kingdom. We know his apostles didn't, you know, all the way up to the point that he was put to death. They still were looking for an earthly kingdom, so... So I, I know they didn't understand it, and if they didn't understand it, I doubt seriously that anybody else did. Uh, but Jesus tried to explain it on a number of different occasions to a number of different people. Uh, but but I, I don't think, because they had always been taught, and this is something I think we need to see. When you've been taught something all your life, and somebody starts telling you that this doesn't mean what you've always been told, it means something different. It's hard for us to accept that. And it's hard for us to grasp that, you know, I've been told this all my life. It means this. How can it mean something else? Well, I think if we understand that, and we're all like that. I think everybody's that way. If we understand that, then it makes it a whole lot easier for us to see why the Jews of the day, in the days of Jesus were looking for a physical kingdom and had no concept of a spiritual kingdom. Uh, and, and so I think, it, you know, as, as Emily pointed out, it's easier for us to look back and having the completed revelation of the New Testament and the explanations that are given and many times even the quotation of these prophecies that seem to be directed toward the physical kingdom but are applied to the spiritual kingdom. I think we have though the advantage of seeing that explanation given uh, where they did not. And, and so I think that... Um, May, we may be a little hard on them sometimes uh, in our, our looking at the way they looked at it because it's easier for us to see that. Uh, and in fact, the, the last part of this question, explain how this promise was fulfilled in a physical, national way, how it was also fulfilled in a spiritual way. And the physical sense in which this, was, this prophecy was fulfilled was what? We've already... Okay, he brought them back to Jerusalem, and, and when you go to Ezra and Nehemiah, you read the stories of how they came back out of captivity, and they rebuilt the city walls, they rebuilt the temple, uh, they, they reestablished the worship of uh, the temple worship, and, and so on. And so you see all of this being done in a physical sense with Israel, with Israel or Judah uh, in, in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. However, it was also fulfilled, I believe, in a spiritual sense, which refers to what? Okay, what, what we normally call the church. Uh, God's kingdom today, uh, his spiritual kingdom. Uh, and and the, the, the term, we, we think in our minds church, but that, that term's not used nearly as much in the New Testament as some other terms uh, to refer to God's people. All right, number 17, true or false, in verses 33 and 34, God answers the question Jeremiah asked in verse 25. Now, if you go back to verse 25, 
Jeremiah said, You've said to me, O Lord God, buy for yourself the field with money, call in the witness, although the city is given into the hands of the Chaldeans. And so basically his question is, God, why are you having me buy this land when it's going to be worthless? Because the Chaldeans are going to take over and destroy everything. Now, does God, true or false, God answers that in verses 43 and 44. Yeah, that's true. In, in verse 44, or 43, he says, Fields shall be bought in the land of which you say it's a desolation without man or beast. It's given into the hand of the Chaldeans. Men shall buy fields for money, sign and seal deeds, call in witnesses in the land of Benjamin. And that's where this property was, was in the land of Benjamin. In the environs of Jerusalem, in the cities of Judah, in the cities of the hill country, in the cities of the lowland, the cities of Negev, for I will restore their fortunes, declares the Lord. So God says, okay, all of this is going to come back, and, and when people do come back, then all this land is going to be worth something and sold. Uh, and so it will be done. How was this significant for the people who were about to go into captivity? Okay, it was, it was given to them so that they would have hope and assurance that God did still care about them and God was going to take care of them. How much do you think they really even believed it when they were taken into captivity? I doubt, I doubt if most of them really even believed it. Uh, of course, lots and lots and lots of them were killed and, and were not taken captive. Uh, and, and, and then the ones that were taken captive, uh, there's no real indication that initially, even when they were taken captive, that they accepted what Jeremiah was saying about what was going on and why it was happening. You don't see any mass efforts for the people to repent and change and do better immediately. Now, over a period of time, they do. Uh, but, but as far as just immediately, you don't see that uh, take place just immediately when... Uh, I think all of them came to run because they were getting the best harvest treatment. Yeah. Being dragged and bruised and everything else, so the originals are told. Yeah. And, and, and the, the point that God makes to them over and over again is that you are my people and I do care about you. And I do want you to do what's right, and I do want to bless you. Uh, you know, God, God never punished the children of Israel because he, he enjoyed seeing them being punished. That wasn't why he did it. You know, he did it because he was trying to get them to repent and change and serve him. And, and he told them if they didn't that they would be punished, and so he, he didn't have any choice. He had to punish them because he had promised them that he would. All right, anything else on chapter 32? Chapter 33 just is a continuation of chapter 32. And when chapter 33 opens, where is Jeremiah? Okay, he's still in the court. You know, we talked about that in the beginning of the last chapter. Uh, he is being held as captive, as a prisoner. He was confined to the court of the guard. Uh, uh, one, one, fact, one translation says that he was shut up in the court uh, of the guard. So uh, he's, he's being held prisoner uh, here. Now, just as a matter of remembering why last time, why was Jeremiah being in prison. Why was he being held? Okay, because he was saying things that the king and the royalty did not like. He was saying that Nebuchadnezzar is going to destroy this place and you're not going to escape and you'll look eyeball to eyeball with King Nebuchadnezzar and talk to him face to face and you will be taken captive along with the other people. And of course, King Zedekiah didn't like that, and so uh, he he locked up Jeremiah. That's a, that's an interesting concept. If you don't like the message somebody's giving you, and you lock them up, what good does that do? You don't have to listen to them anymore. 
You don't have to listen to them anymore, okay? Uh, at, at least he didn't do what Herod did with John the Baptist and cut his head off. <laughs> uh, and of course, I think that's God's providence because God wanted Jeremiah to, to speak. And he, in fact, he told him, he said, I'm not going to let him kill you. So, Yeah. Yeah, that, that may be true. Yeah, he's probably safer being locked up in the, the court of the guard than he would have been if he had been out in the city when the invasion took place. All right. Uh, it says, compare verse 3, which says, Call to me and I'll answer you and I'll tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. Uh, and says, compare this to the promises back in chapter 29, verses 12 through 14. To whom were the promises of chapter 29 made? If you go back and you read chapter 29, the promises were made to whom? Uh, no, actually it was the ones that had been already taken captive and were in Babylon. This is the chapter where God, Jeremiah speaks, God had Jeremiah speak and send word by somebody over to, to Babylon and tells them, uh, you know, why they're there. You remember he told them that you need to just do the best you can for the city and go ahead and plant and build houses and have families and all that kind of stuff because you're going to be there a while. <coughs> Uh, and eventually God will bring you out, but for the time being, you're there for a while. And of course, they didn't like that. Uh, but that, that's what 29 is about. Um, now, how could these long-range promises contained in chapter 33 give hope for the now-besieged inhabitants of Jerusalem? This is really a repeat of what we just looked at in the previous chapter. Okay, it, it would give them hope because God is promising them that they will return to the land, that God's going to bring his people back and he's going to rebuild the, the city and, and, and the, the nation again. Does the truth of verse 3 apply today? Verse 3 says, Call to me, I will answer you, and I will tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. Does that apply to us today? Okay. Uh, I, th I think it does. Uh, can you think of a New Testament passage that might say something like that or similar to that or the, say the same truth? There's probably several. The one, the one that came to my mind was James chapter 4. Uh, and there you remember, uh, he says, verse 7, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, he'll flee from you, draw near to God, he'll draw near to you, cleanse your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts, you double-minded, be miserable and mourn and weep, let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to gloom, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. Basically what he is saying there is, you know, if... If you'll turn to God and serve God, then God will be with you and he will bless you and take care of you. And that's exactly what he's saying here in, in the book of Jeremiah in this, in this verse. But uh, it says uh, he's going to show great and mighty things. So maybe we're not going to see miracles happen and that will be great and mighty things. Oh. Uh, Paul said, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and height and length and depth 
and to know the love of God which surpasses knowledge, you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all we ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be glory in the church in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Paul says God can and does do things that is beyond our imagination today. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that it's working miracles in the sense that we think of miracles. But God does do things for us uh, and he, he lifts people up that are fallen. He saves people that are lost. He does all kinds of great and powerful things today. It's not necessarily in the sense of, of miracles, but I think he does do that still. Number three, throughout the book of Jeremiah, with all the predictions of dire destruction, what did God keep promising them? Health and healing. Okay, health and healing. Verses six and seven. Uh, he said, I'll reveal to them an abundance of peace and truth. I will restore the fortunes of Judah and the fortunes of Israel and rebuild them as they were at first. So, so he says, I'm, I'm going to give a complete restoration to the people once they turn back to me. And if, if you go back and you read some of the that we've already studied, he says repeatedly that once they are in captivity that the people will turn back to him and they will repent and they will begin serving him again. And when they do, then he will bring them back uh, and reestablish uh, the land for them. Again, this question is sort of like we've already seen twice. What was the good of such promises when all around them they saw suffering and death. I mean, they were being literally starved to death. And Jeremiah said, oh, don't worry about it. Everything's going to be okay. God's going to take care of you. But you're going to have to go to captivity first and some of you are going to be killed. Uh, but then eventually God's going to take care of you. So what good does that do? Gave them a future open. It's long range. I mean, there's, there's no question about it, you know. In fact, on one instance, God does specifically tell them it's going to be 70 years. Well, that, that pretty well means that the generation that's being taken is not going to be the generation coming back. There, there were a few of the people who were taken captive that actually did come back to the land. Uh, and, and we know that because when they started rebuilding the temple, it says uh, that there were those who had seen the original temple that wept because uh, the glory of the new temple was nowhere near the glory of the old temple. Uh, even though it was a magnificent building, it, it didn't even come close to comparing to what they had had before. And, and so the people that had seen the previous one wept about it. So that tells us that there were at least some of the same very same people that went that, that came back. Number five, the Lord said he would blank from all their blank and blank, their blank and blank and blank and blank. God said he would do what? Cleanse, Cleanse them from all their iniquity and pardon their iniquity that they had sinned against him. Sometimes when we think about being forgiven of sins, it, it may be easy for us, and I've, I've known people that have done this, uh, and I'm not going to say I haven't ever done it, but uh, I try not to because I'm aware of it, but uh, it's easy for us to think that since God forgives sin, that he really just sort of looks at it lightly and that sin's not really that important. And so God says, okay, because I really love you and I care about you, I'm going to just let it go and I'm just going to overlook it. And... But he doesn't. 
Uh, and, and, you know, we, we understand, at least to some degree, that the justice of God demands that sin be punished. And so he gave his son to die. And so there's nothing light or frivolous or, or, or unimportant about God forgiving people. I mean, when God forgives somebody, it's only because even these people that were being forgiven here are forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ. Their, their, their true forgiveness came through the blood of Christ. Now, that's, you know, that's serious, and it, it, may, it means that sin is always serious. That's, that's the point that I'm trying to make. The result would be to God a okay a joy and praise a name of joy and a praise and glory before all nations of the earth. Why? Well, let's go ahead. The, those nations would blank and blank because of the blank. Those nations would okay. They would hear and they would fear and tremble because all of the of the goodness and prosperity, or one translation says the good and the peace that God would provide. Now, why why was that important? Why why is that important? Okay. The the goal of God for mankind is always that man glorifies God and that he honors God. And God is glorified when people recognize who he is and recognize his power. Uh and and, and I always I always think about Rahab and how she talks about the, the inhabitants of the land of Canaan and how she says our hearts have melted and we don't have any strength because we have heard the stories about your God. We heard how God brought you out of Egypt and parted the water and killed the armies of, destroyed the armies of Pharaoh. How long had it been since God brought them out of Egypt when Rahab said that? How long had that been? Uh-oh. No. Okay, let's... All right, let's think about it a minute. Okay, it's 40 years, yeah. It was 40 years because they wandered 40 years. So they left the land of Egypt. 40 years later, Rahab says... These people up here are still scared to death of your God because of what he did 40 years ago. Now, in the process of that, they also destroyed uh, Og and Sihon and some of the other kings of some pretty big nations along the way uh, and didn't even have an army. And yet they were able to destroy these kings. And so everybody knew that God was really God and that he was powerful and that they couldn't stand up against this God. So, so that's, that's the way God wanted to be recognized. And so he's saying to these people, okay, once I bring you back, then other nations are going to see this and they're going to know that I really am God and, and they're going to give glory to God. And so I, it's, it's important that we recognize that God must be glorified in everything. When the remnant returned from captivity, what would the people say? Okay, uh, there in verses 10 and 11, give thanks to the Lord of hosts for the Lord is good for his loving kindness or his mercy endures forever. His loving kindness is everlasting. Uh, and so he says, this is going to be the voice of joy and gladness and revelry and, and, and praise and so on. And, and it's going to be a matter of giving thanks to God for what he has done. Uh, and when the when the captivity comes back, 
uh, which parts of this prayer are appropriate for Christians today. Okay. Uh, and, and that really is the prayer part. Uh, and, and so I think if, if, you know, that consider, I consider that as really the prayer itself. And so I, I basically said all of it. Uh, discuss Christian use of quotations from the Old Testament in songs and prayer. Think of New Testament examples. Uh, if, if you'll remember uh, when, when Jesus, well, when you, have, you actually have songs of praise and, and, and so on that are given by Mary, uh, by uh, Simeon in the temple, by Zacharias, uh, all related to that, that time period. Uh, James says if, if anybody is uh, happy let him do what he says let him sing and if, if passages that we're familiar with that talk about singing would be Ephesians 5 19 Colossians 3 16 and those passages tell us that we sing what psalms, hymns and spiritual songs yeah uh, and so I think that uh, we, we see a, a lot of use of uh, psalms and, and so on. In fact, from, from secular history, and, and of course, sometimes... It, well, we know yeah, David was a singer, and, and of course he... David not only was a singer, but he set up a group of the Levites to be singers for, for their worship, uh, which was not a, a really a part of the original plan that God gave them, but, but he set up a group to play the instruments and another group to, play, to sing the vocal music uh, and, and in their worship. And so, you know, it was... And you find a lot of the quotations in the New Testament from the Psalms. Lots and lots of them from the Psalms. Uh, I, I think we do well to sing Psalms. We don't sing them a whole lot. Uh, some of our songs are from the Psalms, but we don't sing them near as much. And this is why I started to say a while ago, according to secular history, the early church sang a lot of hymns from the Psalms. Uh, and... Of course, they, they didn't sing four-part harmony like we do today. Uh, that wasn't the kind of singing. That is more of a chanting from what we know. Uh, but, but they used the Psalms as, as their, a lot of times the book of Psalms was their songbook. Uh, that was what, what they used. And there's, there's just a lot of the Psalms that are, would be appropriate for us to sing today. So a lot of what they did wasn't sing, but it was a singing. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was more of a chanting than it was what we call singing today. Yes. And in a lot of the eastern countries, they still do that. You know, you, you listen to some of the stuff they do, and it's, it's more of a chanting. Which Old Testament books describe fulfillment of the promised physical return in the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the temple? Do what? Okay. Haggai, Malachi, uh, Ezra, there's uh, Nehemiah, Zechariah. Yeah. Uh, the 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 description that is most vividly given in the historical part of it is is more Ezra and Nehemiah. These others are, but they do also. Uh, all right.
carefully read verses 14 through 18. And she says some of these of question number 10 and question number 11 overlap, but both are important. Verses 14 through 18. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good word which I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days at that time I will cause a righteous branch of David to spring forth. He shall execute justice and righteousness on the earth. In those days Judah shall be saved, Jerusalem shall dwell in safety, and this is the name by which she shall be called, The Lord is Our Righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, and the Levitical priest shall never lack a man before me to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to prepare sacrifices continually. Uh, Now, read verses 14 through 18, which refer to blank, who was physically a descendant of Blank. Okay, so verses 14 through 18 refer to who? Refer to Christ. All right, blank was physically a descendant of blank. Okay, Christ was physically a descendant of David, of the tribe of Judah. All right. Since his resurrection and ascension, he is seated on his Throne at the right hand of God. Okay. Now, in the New Testament, Christians are called blank and blank. This one sort of, this question is sort of a combination of all these passages that are given. (laughs) You're supposed to read all of these and figure out what she had in mind. Okay, you might, might answer it different ways, yeah. All right, Uh, New Testament Christians are called blank and blank and a royal blank. Do what, Amy? Okay, living sacrifices, fruit, and royal priesthood. Uh, The royal priesthood was pretty easy. Uh, I've got kings and priests. Uh, they Christians are referred to, to as kings and priests and a royal priesthood, uh, but what you've got is also in there too, who offer their blank as blank. So, so offer their psalms, so, so. songs. Okay, I've got, I've got who offer their bodies as spiritual sacrifices, which would be the one from Hebrews, yeah. They offer their bodies as spiritual frac- sacrifices, the fruit of the lips is a sacrifice of praise to God, okay. Uh, and like I said, you can, you can get some different words from all of these, maybe in some of those blanks. Living sacrifices, okay. Yeah. Uh, but but the idea is, and, and again, I think that there's two or three points that we need to make here. Number one is that that he's, he's talking here about a spiritual kingdom. He's talking about Christ coming. He's talking about the Messiah that's going to to change things and, and so on. And and so he's talking about spiritual Israel not physical Israel. And this is one of those where, you know, God is saying, okay, I'm going to bring the people back. I'm going to rebuild Jerusalem and Judah and all that. But he's also saying here, there's going to be a spiritual kingdom and a spiritual sacrifice. And when he talks about the the descendant from the throne of David that will reign forever, the, the branch that is raised up, uh, universally refers to in the prophets as, as referring to Jesus Christ, uh, he's going to be the Lord of Righteousness. That refers to Christ. Uh, so there's several terms through here that that it almost has to be applied to Christ. Now, I don't know any way that you could fit it to, to anybody else. Uh, 
and so I think there's, there's no question he's talking about. It, it, did, it did, in fact, sort of puzzle me when he talks about the Levitical priest shall never lack a man uh, who is offering sacrifices. Uh, but I think the, the, the resolution to that is, is what she has here in this second uh, question, that we are a priesthood, we are a royal priesthood, we offer up sacrifices of, of our bodies and our lips and our lives to God. And so that prophecy is being fulfilled even though we're not literally physically from the tribe of the Israelites, we're not physically of the tribe of Levi, but we are spiritual Israel and spiritual priests uh, that serve, serve God. Yeah. Could it could be, but I think it's more talking about that us as as priests that offer up sacrifices to God with our lives and our lips and so on. Um, but uh, this this is one of those that that is a little more difficult to to decipher and, and comprehend than than some of the passages I think. Anyway, we'll stop right there and we will pick up with question number 12 next week, Lord willing. My dear looks nice with her. She slapped me a lot.
because of all the wonderful things you do for us every day. and We just thank you for this time we have to come together to worship you this evening and study from your word. Father, as we run about so busy during this Christmas season and sometimes we tend to be selfish and we just ask you to help us to look outside of ourselves to be willing to share what we have with others. And especially those that are less fortunate, but not just during this season, but all year long. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful gift of Jesus. We thank you for the salvation that we can have through him. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with those that are suffering, those that are sick, and those that are hurting, and help us to be an encouragement to them, and help us to lift their burdens as much as we can. 
We pray, Father, for our young people that you will help them to understand how important it is to serve you in their lives and to do what's right. Be with those of us who are parents and grandparents and even great-grandparents and just pray you'll give us wisdom to do our part. Be with the church here at Ephesus that we can be the church you want us to be. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. evening I'll be reading Psalms 23, Psalms the 23rd chapter, and making a few brief comments to them as I read along. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Here in this psalm, David is saying that the Lord is his shepherd, and you and I as God's children, as Christians. The Lord is our shepherd. I shall not want. Our shepherd, our Lord, is going to provide all our needs, all the needs that we need to, to live this life while here on earth. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. That green pasture means that there's, there's tender grass in that pasture for us as lambs, as, as sheep, to graze on it. Our shepherd provides that. Our shepherd, which is our Lord, provides these green pastures. He leads me beside the still water. No, if you go to the river and you see kind of steel waters running there, that's an indication of a, there's a lot of water there. There's usually real deep water there where that water runs shallow. <coughs> he restores my soul. with his rod and his staff. You know, as the shepherd protects the sheep in the pasture, he has that rod and staff to drive off any 
beast or wolves or bear or whatever. And spiritually, our shepherd has that rod and staff to ward off the devil, ward off Satan, keep Satan away from us. And we don't need to have any fear of death because our shepherd, the Lord, is our Lord. Verse 5, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemy. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. My cup runs over because there are so many blessings that our shepherd, our Lord, our blessings are, to, are in you. We couldn't count them if we sat down and Started writing, and we couldn't. Uh, we could write from now on, and still couldn't count all our blessings because our cup is running over. <coughs> Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. After we pass through that valley of the shadow. spiritual life is going to be in heaven with God the Father God the Son which when we get to heaven God the Son will be our brother we, we will be equal to God the Son when we get to heaven and that's not just a temporary thing when we get to heaven we will dwell in eternity. I've heard some some people say we will dwell through eternity. No, no, there's no such thing as dwelling through eternity. When we say we dwell through eternity, that indicates that it'll, that there'll be an end sometime. No, there'll be no end. We will dwell in eternity in heaven. Now, I realize this chapter tonight and this reading and a few comments have not been to what we need to do to be a Christian. But these blessings, all of these prophecies that is spoken of here in Psalms 23 are only promised to God's children, to the, to the lambs and, and the shepherd's pasture. So our question tonight is, are you a lamb and a shepherd's pastor? In other words, are you a Christian? If not, you, you can't partake of these promises. You don't qualify for these promises. So to qualify for these promises, you have to be a lamb of God. If you believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, if you will confess that belief with your mouth, if you'll turn from your sinful ways, turn your life over to God, and be baptized in that watery grave of baptism, you will then be alive. You will be in the shepherd's pasture. <laughs> And you can partake of all these promises that he has promised in Psalm 23. If we can help you in any way, would you come as we stand and say?
appreciate everyone being here this evening. Uh, did anyone get the attendance? 47. 47. 47. That's a good number. It's a little, a little higher than we've had recently in Weezy Night, so we're, we're glad you're here. Uh, wasn't given any announcements. Do we have any updates on that? Sure. Sure. Mom is in the hospital and is hoping to go to rehab real soon. Uh, my brother Henry is out of the hospital and in, uh, it's on oxygen, but he's at home. Is there any, anything else that needs to be announced? If not, I'll ask Brother Springer if he would do so. I'm going to try to say that, Father, we are so thankful for the blessings that you have given us. Father, we are more mindful of the spiritual blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. And for the forgiveness of sin, so that one day we can stand justified before you through your grace. Father, we just pray that each of us will strive to live for you each day to, to be what you would have us. And Father, during this holiday season, we pray that you'll be with all those who are traveling and keep them safe. And Father, we just ask you to please bless each of us to have a good holiday and to, to remember. All the things that you've done for us. Father, we just you to be with us and forgive us when we do call and pray all of us in Christ. Amen. I tried on for a converse one time. I realized that. It's tough to get on. Uh -uh. <laughs> Thank you. 